me kick this conversation off by asking you about your own journey as an entrepreneur. Did you anticipate Under Armour to become such a big global brand, uh, challenging as it were, uh, the, the global well-known established players? Absolutely not. Absolutely not to every entrepreneur here. Whenever we come to a new market or I get to go to a city or anything else, I appreciate how fortunate that I've been in my journey to this point. And there's been uh, lots of ups and plenty of downs and all sorts of things. Uh, but the one thing I know is that wherever I go, if I can hopefully deposit some, some part of a gift, and that gift is not a transaction of Under Armour just doing business in India, uh, but that gift is hopefully being able to have all the superpowers that are included that every piece of apparel or footwear that is our Under Armour brand product, um, but also our story. Because the story of where we came from to where we are is one of, of, it's one of passion, it's one of innovation and great products, but it's very much a story of entrepreneurship. And so when I get the opportunity to speak um, to a group like yourselves, um, I want to be able to take advantage of that and hopefully maybe pass something on that uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's all of you, but maybe it's just one uh, that may be on that edge of, can I do it? I don't think so. I have this question, this self-doubt, and maybe I can, uh, I can't answer that for you, but hopefully I can maybe bring you, bring you over the line a little bit. This is an athlete's brand, isn't it? How would you define the DNA of what Under Armour stands for? It's, a, it's an athlete brand without question, and we talk about um, what Under Armour brings to the market. Um, it is the stable of athletes that we have today. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I keep using the word passion, but it is that group of athletes of whether it is Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian of all time, Stephen Curry, arguably uh, the greatest shooter in, in NBA history, Tom Brady, uh, the greatest of all time as a football player, Lindsey Vaughn uh, as a skier, uh, Jordan Spieth as a golfer, and so uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson uh, as, a, uh, as an entertainer. If I can so, just interrupt you there, specifically on the celebrity endorsement game, the way Under Armour sort of scooped uh, Stephen Curry is very well known. Uh, can you talk us through what that game is about uh, and how does it work for, the, for your brand? Yeah. It's actually a lot of fun. So uh, we signed Stephen Curry after his third year in the NBA and he had not made an all-star team yet. And, uh, and actually that signing was one uh, that I could tell you was a lot of thought, a lot of energy and effort, and it was all those things. Um, one of the things we did was Stephen Curry, uh, and again, this is just for the entrepreneurs in the room, is that there's more doors and ways into a room than simply walking through the front door. And it's up to each and every one of you to find out what that door is. So. We targeted Stephen Curry. We had someone that was out in the Bay Area that was looking for him. Um, Stephen Curry uh, was the number eight draft pick, um, highly regarded, but we knew he was sort of a second thought to Nike, who we have signed with before. Um, but the person who was in the locker next to Stephen Curry was this great guy named Ken Bazemore. And so Ken Bazemore, um, uh, he's since been traded to uh, the Atlanta Hawks. He plays there now. But he was like a journeyman. Uh, he was undrafted. And so we signed Ken Bazemore for basically no money. And knowing that he was locker mates with Stefan, we just overwhelmed him with product and service and just totally took care of Ken, knowing that Stefan, who's locker next to him, was like, man, like, Ken, you, you barely get like three or four minutes a night when you play, and they take that good to carry you. And Ken was like, yeah, imagine what they're going to do for you. So it was targeting Ken that got Stefan's attention with us to begin with. And then once we had him sort of teed up, we got ourselves in the conversation, and then it was a, came down to basically this idea between re-sign with Nike, potentially sign with Adidas, or this new brand of Under Armour. We were pitching and saying, we want you to be the face of our brand. We want Stephen Curry to be the face of Under Armour. And there's a lot of athletes that we approach or talk to about that, that you'll be amazed how many shy away from that opportunity. Stephen Curry leaned into it. So I could tell you that the science of how we ultimately signed Stephen uh, was one thing. Our, our competitor, uh, when they were going to re-sign him, uh, they used a pitch deck that they used for another athlete and forgot to replace some of the names in the pitch deck that Stefan noticed. And someone also called him Steven instead of Stefan, which is a major mistake as well. Uh, and then the, the, the final nail in the coffin was uh, Stefan had a, a daughter named Riley, 
um, who was about uh, 18 months, two years old at the time. And uh, uh, this is the science that Stefan used to sign to pick his brand. Uh, he basically, he sat in his office, in, in his living room and he said, honey, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And so he said, let's find out what Riley thinks. So they set up a shoe box with the shoe on top, one from Nike, one from Adi, and one from Under Armour. And he said, uh, Riley, I want you to tell me, what do you think? And his daughter could barely even speak, but she sort of gets up and hobbles over and she picks up the Nike shoe first and she picks it up, looks at it, turns it front and back and throws it over her shoulder. Then she reaches down and she picks up the Adidas shoe and she picks it up and she looks at it front and back and she throws it over her shoulder. Then she finally reaches down and I think by the hand of God, she reached and she grabbed <laughs> this golden Under Armour shoe. She lifted it up. She turned around and she said, Daddy, this one. <laughs> Sometimes you just get lucky in life and thank goodness for children, especially the brilliance of Riley Curry. So we are happy and blessed to this day. And so that was the science that went into signing. So Kevin, we're talking to a very young audience. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you is how, how do you as a brand stay relevant uh, and young and cool to a young audience? Yeah, uh, it's, it happens, it has to happen every single day, you know. Um, as a company that was started, as we say, by athletes, for athletes. I was a football player at, at the University of Maryland and I was simply an athlete that didn't like the way my cotton t-shirt felt beneath my pads when I played football. And the only option that was available for athletes at the time, innovation was effectively limited to footwear. That was the only equipment. Apparel was just apparel. You'd wear a short sleeve cotton t-shirt in the summer and a long sleeve cotton t-shirt cotton t-shirt in the winter, and there was no real alternative. And that's where the idea for me as an athlete saying, I don't want to wear a soaking wet cotton t-shirt when I'm playing football. I don't want to have to change my pads after uh, pre-game warm-ups and then at halftime and constantly being weighed down. And that innovation is what led Under Armour to be born, that being close to the athlete. And so we know it was so organic to me and, and the people that would come work for me, uh, they, 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 they weren't uh, the MBAs uh, uh, from here. They weren't the, 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 the Harvard, Law, Harvard MBAs weren't lining up to work at Under Armour. And so it was my friends, it was the people that I knew that I convinced to come work with me and take this chance on uh, with $16,000 in cash with uh, $40,000 in available credit cards that I had to us to convince us to get started. So we were our consumer. We were 23, 24, 25. We just lived it and owned it. And then we grew up as a brand. And today as I think about what that means, it means true understanding of first and foremost how we can deliver the world's greatest most innovative product which is our job to do that also is stylish that looks great of course that makes you feel great but as we say is important to Under Armour is the foundation of a performance brand is the product must perform if it's Under Armour if I'm wearing it you can say that's a cool top is what you should say and then the next question out of your mouth should be, if it's Under Armour, what does it do? And I get it, I, we know cool. I have a 12-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son, and I battle this of what they're allowed to wear. Is Supreme allowed in the house or not? Right? It mildly is, it's okay. Is a Supreme Nike collab allowed in the house? Absolutely, frickin lutely no. So setting these ground rules are important. But that doesn't make me an expert because I have a focus group of one. What makes us an expert though is that now we have a team of 14,000. Now we have an insights engine that is listening and talking and communicating with the consumer on a regular basis. Now we have the advantage of a category management structure of a head of running, a head of training, a head of basketball, a head of, of nine different categories that we have across our business men's and women's that allows us to be as close to the consumer right next to consumer to listen to hear what they have to say to inform the decisions we make and then it's using the power of our global operating model to be able to drive through the world's most innovative and technical product with the world's most beautiful design that makes people inspired inspired let me take you back to the your, your journey as an entrepreneur Somewhere in the course of this journey, you did have a chance to sell out and you chose not to. 
Why? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. In 2005, um, we, in May, we filed our S1 to go public. And at the time, we started the business again in 1996. It was a small little row house in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. that my grandmother, who would passed away a few years before, had owned. Uh, no one was there, so I was able to move in a couple blocks from Georgetown University. I was sleeping and living upstairs. I had, I had a sales office on the ground floor that I converted the dining room into, and I was keeping the inventory for the company in the basement. Um, from that journey, we, we posted uh, $17,000 in revenue in that first year, then 110,000, then 400,000, um, then a million three, five million, 20 million, 50 million, 115 million, 200 million. That was the end of 2004, and then we decided to go public in 2005. Um, as a coming off a $200 million year, we got a, a call from uh, VF Corporation. Uh, their chairman at the time, a guy named Mackie McDonald, uh, came down and, and uh, made an offer to me, and the offer was close to $800 million. And at the time, I owned more than 50% of the company, and I was 32 years old, and uh, thinking this would, be, uh, this would be a great opportunity. And for some reason, it just didn't feel right. And I remember I spoke to maybe 30 different people whose opinions I asked and said, we've got this offer, um, we can go public in November, or you know, we've got this offer to take the company out. And uh, there were roughly, of the 30 opinions, 27 of them said, you know, basically, so when do you close? Of course you'd sell. Uh, the one that didn't were, uh, one was from our largest customer at the time, a guy named Ed Stack, who ran Dick's Sporting Goods, which is a large, big box sporting goods retailer in the United States. Um, uh, another one was uh, our CFO at the time, who was a very fiscally conservative guy, and I thought it was unusual that he wouldn't think, well, of course, you just put the money in the bank. Uh, and the third was my wife, uh, who just looked at me and just said, um, uh, not unlike Ed, uh, Ed's comment was, for me, it was just never about the money. That wasn't the only thing. And uh, you know, my wife who just said, why, y you love Under Armour. And that basically rolled up to this idea of it just wasn't time, it wasn't the right thing to do. And more importantly, we had much, much greater things to accomplish. And so uh, it, was a, it was a difficult, but a relatively easy decision at the same time. Too. You know, we often talk about successes of brands. Um, tell us as an entrepreneur, about your failures, what did they teach you? There's times I think of like one of our first greatest failures was when we tried to launch women's products for the first time. It was back in 2003, and um, we'd, had our, we'd been really successful with a lot of our commercial partners, our wholesalers, and they were demanding that they have a women's line to complement our men's line because our product was effectively unisex. It was being, the same product was being bought by women that was being sold for men. And I remember the first time we, we tried building it, uh, so I guess it was 2000, maybe it was 2001, 2002. We were about a $5 million company at the time. Uh, so right, it was right around, uh, yeah, right around 2000. And uh, on our way to being a $20 million company. And we built about, uh, about a couple million dollars of, of women's product. And uh, I remember the product coming in, it was supposed to ship in June. Our customers had the orders, they were ready to accept it. And I remember looking at the product and thinking, oh my gosh, this is, this is actually awful. Um, the, it was very masculine with the way it looked. Um, we basically, you could see the attempt that we made to make it feminine was um, creating the color pink. And uh, the lesson to be learned is that the idea of just shrinking it and pinking it does not work for the women's market. And so within that, we made a very difficult decision to actually burn all of that stock that we'd made. And for a you know, 10 or $15 million company to take a million plus dollar hit like that was a very difficult decision. But the most important thing was not to impact the brand and to make sure that we protected the brand. And so our customers were disappointed that they were gonna miss the revenue they thought they had coming in. Um, but it took us time to come back and rebuild it because when I looked at the team that had built our product, uh, it was basically an executive team of men that was trying to build women's product. And so the best answer for that was putting women in leadership to help lead and drive our business. And that has been such a success factor for us today, where today, um, you know, women's represents uh, roughly 20, a little more than 20% of our business, and it should be higher. 
but it's over a, a $1.2 billion business for us today, which makes us one of the largest women's brands in the world. And what would you want to tell a, a wannabe entrepreneur sitting at IIT Mumbai today? When I get in the elevator, because I get questions a lot of people you know, sort of seeking out and saying, you know, and some of you may have questions in here of, I need to ask you this question. Like, can you, let me get to you. I need a mentor. I need someone else. Like, I'll, I'll just tell you that the world that exists today, it, it may live in, in Greek mythology somewhere, but there's no such thing as an oracle. There's no such thing as one conversation or one question or one answer in any amount of time that we may spend up here. And I'm not telling you not to like, let's have a conversation, but any amount of time that we could spend, I'm not going to be able to give you the answer to that one thing that said, this turned it for me. It is going to be just like life or just like school or just like business. It's going to be a constant heads down, chopping wood over and over and over approach. Like to be an entrepreneur is not a silver bullet. Uh, it's not, I'm going to go get funding, and funding and getting venture funding is not success. That's the first step. How much money you raise is not success. It's about revenue, and it's about profit. And the way that you get both of those is by delivering for your consumer, by satisfying, by answering for your consumer, and that's what matters more than anything. And when I typically talk to entrepreneurs about raising capital, um, the first thing that I say to them is that if you have your an option, uh, my first advice to you would be, instead of just going to someone else to raise capital, which typically will cost you equity in your company, if you believe in your idea that much, it'll probably cost you input or a board seat that they'll then have someone else in your kitchen helping to shape what should be your vision. And uh, if you wanna raise money, go sell what you have. Go sell your inventory. Um, there's a cool story that, um, uh, one of the big breaks that we had was at the end of 1999, uh, we were lucky enough to be featured in this Oliver Stone movie called Any Given Sunday. It was starring Al Pacino and Cameron Diaz and Charlton Heston, and this whole list of A actors that was in it. And uh, we had this, this break and we knew that we were gonna be like a character in the movie would be so prominent. But I thought people would see the logo and they wouldn't know where to find it. And so we were dead set on running this ad advertisement in ESPN, the magazine. And uh, in ESP and the magazine, we, uh, uh, the ad cost $25,000 and had to be paid up front. And so we took a shot and I decided we were gonna run this half page ad that would feature our phone number, our website, and uh, any given Sunday, the movie was gonna come out like Christmas day, December 25th or 23rd or 25th. And the ad came out uh, uh, right around the same time. And the goal that we had was, uh, uh, you know, we want people to know that this is a real brand. It's not just a, a, a fictitious movie character. And, and when we ran that ad, uh, we were in desperate need of money. Um, all we had was $25,000 that I had to scrape together from several people. Uh, I, we had about 15 employees at the time, and I asked anyone who would volunteer to cancel their paychecks for the next two pay cycles uh, would receive equity in the company. We cobbled together the $25,000, we ran that ad, and from that $25,000 ad, uh, our phones basically blew up. I think we'd done, uh, we'd done a million three the year before, and the two weeks following that ad coming, the first two weeks of January, uh, in the movie coming out, uh, we did close to $800,000 in revenue. So we went from a $1.3 million company for a full year to doing $800,000 in the first two weeks of the year just from running an ad and sold through all of our inventory. And whatever we had with like, that we could get out the door, we were pushing and selling it. And once we got them on the phone or got them to the website, it was how fast can we, how fast can we sell? And that to me is the best spirit because if not, I would have not taken the chance on running that ad, on taking the chance of working with the people that were on our team that I love, that I'd rather have them have the equity than someone than an outside venture capitalist. Um, you know, it would've been a very different story. We would've been out in the market trying to raise a million dollars, and that million dollars would've cost me 30, 40, 50% of the company, who knows how much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.